Hey everyone, and welcome to the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. And just another reminder, I record this show every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So if you want to join the show live, ask your questions live, join in the conversation, ask follow on questions, stick around for overtime. The show is actually about three times longer than what we have time to edit. So it's a good time. And you should definitely come and join us. So 5pm Pacific time on the YouTube channel, there will be a notification somewhere on my homepage of my channel. So you can remind yourself uh, when the next one's coming out. Also, I put a reminder of where the live stream is going to be into my weekly newsletter. And finally, we post a link to the live stream to the patrons. So if you're a patron and you missed the live show, there'll be a link to the live show because we make the show on invisible unlisted. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't pollute our YouTube algorithm. So all right. So thank you, everyone. And let's get into the questions. Alexandru Vadiman. Hey, Fraser. Why has humanity decided that aliens may come to visit us with bad intentions? Why would they look for our resources by traveling on something that can only be in our imagination? Thanks. All right. So I guess the, the question that you're really asking is why will the aliens be bad? Why do we assume that the aliens are going to be bad? And there's kind of two parts to this process. The first part is that when we look at humanity's exploration of the Earth, it generally worked out poorly for the native inhabitants of various places, whoever had more military might, more capability, more technology, could essentially do whatever they wanted. And, you know, in some cases, you know, you would have a war, you'd have an invasion, you would have a battle. In other cases, the technology was overwhelming, and they would just stomp through and spread disease and take over territory. But when you look at sort of other creatures, there's humanity, and we're say, we're intelligent and advanced. And then you have other creatures, say you have gorillas, elephants, rhinoceroses, like they are other species. And historically, humanity's method is to just do whatever we want. They're dumb animals. What they want doesn't really matter. I mean, we kill off the species diversity and we fill planet Earth with pigs and cows and chickens who we're factory farming and we're gonna eat them. So that that's how humanity rolls. And so it is obviously, you know, like super human centric to imagine that any civilization out there is going to do what human beings have done, but it's definitely a risk. And so we definitely need to keep, you know, keep that in our back of our heads that this thing that we always do, and we've done in the past, someone could do this to us, it could be aliens, but it could also just be artificial intelligence it could be something that is more advanced than us that comes along could treat us the way we've treated animals and other societies. But the deeper and the sort of the more uh, sort of universal concept is just this idea that we live in a universe with limited resources. Now it seems like it's a lot like obviously there's like stars and stars are putting off more energy than anyone could ever use. But if you just chart on an exponential curve, the future of even humanity, within just a few 1000 years, we will be utilizing all the energy coming from our star, we will have dismantled all the planets and asteroids in the solar system, we will have essentially capitalized on everything in the solar system. And that sounds terrible. It sounds like a bad idea. So you know, but it's just literally if you take 10,000 years of human growth, and human economic expansion, that is what the future holds a few thousand years, Dyson swarm. And so we can imagine some future where we start to run into other civilizations out there across the universe, ones that are more advanced than us, others that are less advanced than us. And the question is going to be, how are we going to interact with those other civilizations? Are they going to be doing the same thing? Are they going to be expanding, extracting all the resources out of their solar systems? Are they going to be harvesting all the energy from the star? Are they going to be going out and out and farther and farther? And you can imagine one type of civilization, let's call them the berserkers, um, because it's a, sort of a mainstay in science fiction by Fred Saberhagen that they want to eliminate all future rivals. And so they go and enter some star system, 
detect whether there is a potential intelligent civilization living on one of the planets. If it is, annihilate them. And then you leave the planet clear. And then when you get around to needing, you know, when your empire expands, you need those resources, then you move to that place. And so you can imagine a distribution of, on the one hand, berserkers who just see every other civilization as a potential threat, destroy them as quickly as they can, and try to grab as much of the territory of the Milky Way as they can for their own purposes. And then on the other hand, you can imagine just like the most peaceful, harmless, lovely, giving civilization possible, who don't want to leave their solar system, they don't want any trouble. If they meet you, they want to give you all of the gifts and give you medicine and so on. And imagine you have those two societies competing in a Milky Way, who's going to win out? It's going to be the berserkers, right? They're going to run across the peaceful civilization go Oh, it's really nice that you're so sweet, but we need to destroy you because we need to prevent all future threats and we will just pave their planet and remove them from the equation. And so all it takes is one berserker. It just takes one civilization across the entire Milky Way out of say there's say there's a 1000 civilizations in the Milky Way across that wide spectrum from warlike to peaceful. But the ones that are most warlike, unfortunately, are going to be the ones who dominate and take over as much territory as possible. And so while we can't assume that every civilization that we encounter is going to be aggressive, we have to consider the possibility that there is one out there that is extremely aggressive. And how do we know that this civilization that is contacting us that is sending a spacecraft to the solar system is one of the peaceful ones or one of the aggressive ones? Does it make the most sense to just keep our mouths shut and just sit back and study and learn about the Milky Way before we try to encounter or talk to any of these other civilizations. So so I think that is and again, obviously, this is a very kind of human centric history centric, Western centric um, look at the way humanity has behaved in the past and trying to apply that to the bizarre, ineffable and comprehensible intelligence of aliens. But still, it makes sense to be safe and to err on the side of caution. And until we see otherwise, until we are embraced into the Galactic Federation of Peace and Loving uh, Arms, we have to be on guard. Michael McConnell. Hey, Fraser, would we be able to see anything from the center of a cosmic supervoid, considering most stars we see are relatively close to us? Sure, absolutely. Uh, we would still be able to see if we transported the Earth or the solar system into the center of one of these supervoids. Now, we would be able to see essentially the same universe that we see today. I mean, we can see right out to the edge of the observable universe, we can see to 13.8 billion light years away. When we see the cosmic microwave background radiation, we can see galaxies all the way out to just 500 million years after the Big Bang, we can map out the shape and scale of these voids and super voids and walls and clusters and galaxy groupings across most of the observable universe. And so yeah, if we were transported into one of these voids, we would be able to map out from that position. But a deeper question is like, would a civilization develop astronomy in the same way if they're in one of these super voids, because then you wouldn't necessarily see any galaxies around you, you would just see dark skies, assuming there was say there weren't any stars, etc. But still, you would have this instinct that there was something to study in the sky because they would have a, a sun that they are orbiting around, there would probably be other planets. And so they would have built telescopes to observe these other planets, these other stars, and they would build more and more powerful telescopes. And suddenly they'd notice, hey, wait a second, we can see other faint objects in the sky all over the place. They don't have anything to do with the planets. What are they? And as they built bigger telescopes, they'd realize that they were other galaxies. And would start to give a sense that they live in this universe. So even if there was no stars, no galaxies anywhere nearby us, I think we would still develop essentially the same level of astronomy as we have today. Mosaic Monk, what if we lived near the Big Bang? Would we see further? See, this is one of the advantages during the live show is one person asked a question. And now we get a follow up question from someone else, which is great. So you know, say it with me, the Big Bang didn't happen in one place, the Big Bang happened everywhere. 
across all of space, every part of the universe was where the Big Bang happened, because it's an expansion of space, not an explosion in space. And so you live right beside where the Big Bang happened. And so do I and so does someone on a galaxy that's really far away from us and someone who is right out to the edge of the observable universe. They live right beside where the Big Bang happened because the Big Bang happened everywhere. Jason Cullen. Hey, Fraser, will James Webb be able to turn its mirrors towards the Earth and look at it in infrared? Absolutely not. James Webb's whole job is to never see the Earth. When you think about the construction of James Webb, it's got those incredible sun shields, multi layered sun shields designed to put the sun, the Earth, and the moon all in the same spot in the sky behind this sun shield and block them and then allow the telescope to cool down to just a little temperature above the background temperature of the universe, which is like just a few degrees above absolute zero. If they shifted the telescope away and weren't blocking the sun, the moon and the earth with the sun shield, then the telescope would start to heat up, it wouldn't work in the same way. No, it can never, ever look back in that direction. If you want to look at the earth in infrared, we've got satellites that orbit the earth who observe the planet in infrared. It's a very well studied wavelength of planet Earth. So no, no, James Webb will never be used to look at the moon, the sun or the earth. It's always looking away from those three things. T Marty 69 helium three, is it the smaller, faster way to fusion? Not exactly. Um, so, you know, right now, humanity has not really mastered the art of fusion. Now we have built hydrogen bombs, which are essentially a fusion reactor, it's just completely uncontrolled and explodes with enormous energy. And you wouldn't want to try and use that to provide the electricity for your refrigerator, you want to do it in a more controlled manner. And so people are working on a more controlled manner where they fuse hydrogen into helium, or deuterium into helium or other various parts in between in a controlled manner. And it's very complicated. We've done a video, on it, but you know, you have to have incredibly high temperatures, you need to have very high magnetic fields that hold the plasma in a place where it can start to fuse together. It's very complicated, very expensive. And there are a few massive projects right now, which are trying to make essentially you get more energy out of a fusion reaction that you put into it. One of the downsides of fusion is it does give off a lot of radiation, not the same amount of radiation as a fission reaction, but it still is giving off radiation. And over time, the parts of the actual fusion reactor are going to become highly dangerous. And so helium three is interesting because the reaction that helium three gives as you use it in the fusion process, is less radioactive, essentially provides a less dangerous amount of radiation that's coming out. And that's very good. If you need to be very close to your fusion reactor, like say you want to have your fusion reactor on your spaceship, and you want to live on your spaceship and have a fusion reactor just over there and not die to the radiation that's pouring out of your fusion reactor. And so that's why one of the reasons why helium three is kind of exciting. But to be fair, we haven't mastered just regular fusion at any point, like we can't build right now, a building that is the size of an enormous power plant and make a sustained fusion reaction happen in that not to mention, try to figure out and master that technology for helium three, not to mention miniaturize that technology small enough that it could fit on a spacecraft. So you know, people have talked about that mining helium three on the moon is going to be the thing that unlocks the moon. And it's a commercial reason because there's so much more of this helium three that's kind of impregnated into the regolith from the essentially captured solar wind. And it's true. But there is a long chain of technology that we're going to have to accomplish before that even becomes a reason to go. And we'll probably still have plenty of helium three just down here on Earth that you can just use as a byproduct of oil and gas extraction before we'll need to go to the moon to extract. So I think we're going to take a lot, it's going to be a 100 years before we get to a point where helium three reactors are feasible and we're using them. Maybe never, we don't know. We're still too early in this technology. You know, as they say, fusion is always 30 years away. David Waka. Is anyone working on the ethics feasibility of sending domesticated animals to Mars as a food source? 
because we need to break that question into two parts. Like what are the ethic? What are the ethical concerns of sending animals to Mars as a food source? You know, we eat animals already. Some people think it's fine. Other people think it's bad. So I think you're going to have the same ethical arguments about eating animals in a spacecraft or on Mars as you do here on Earth. I can't think of any kind of additional issues that would be related to it. People have proposed that, you know, if you want to get protein on Mars, you're going to be eating crickets or maybe tilapia fish, but you're not gonna be able to really take something bigger. And that's where we sort of shift into the feasibility question that you're asking. And the reality is, is that, you know, here on Earth, livestock takes up the vast majority of humanity's use of the planet. Uh, There's like a study that said, like, we would be able to reforest like two thirds of our farmland if we weren't raising them for pasture for animals or feed for animals, etc. So you can imagine whatever you try to do on Mars, if you're going to try and take a cow, <laughs> you're going to have to have the facilities to grow all of the food and then feed the cow. And it's incredibly inefficient. And so we're going to be looking for sources of protein, which are more efficient. And the most efficient one is going to be plants, forms of algae, bacteria, um, insects, things like that are more efficient at producing protein that we can feed on than livestock. I mean, the only reason that we use livestock cows, things like that is just because space isn't a problem here on Earth, but it would absolutely be on a spacecraft or on Mars or whatever. So I think people living in the offshore settlements will not have access to meat, maybe cultured meat. I mean, I think cultured meat is going to be the way that makes sense that you have a meat lattice that you feed um, various nutrients and it grows something that is kind of like meat and it kind of tastes like meat, it provides protein, but it was never attached to an animal. Uh, that's probably going to be the most feasible source of that. And, and then you could save you don't even have, need to have the cow and you don't have to go through deal with all the ethical issues of having the cow. So I think that's going to be the solution. Samet Adesoy. Isn't it more likely that we'll develop machines to traverse the universe instead of actually traveling around? Yeah, of course, the technology required to carry a human being to space is vastly more complicated. When you think about how you need a capsule or a space station with circulating water and toilets that don't work very well and hot and cold spacesuits and all of this technology that's just apparatus designed to keep human beings alive compared to a CubeSat that, you know, beep boop, and it has little solar panels, and then it's happy, right? You just take that and then it just scales exponentially bigger when you try to send a human being to another star system, the chances, and this is where I kind of ruin science fiction Christmas, like without a dramatic new kind of technology, like if we don't figure out a warp drive, or hyperspace, or a wormhole or something like that, like you would be looking at 10s of 1000s of years in some kind of crazy colony ship like an asteroid that you are mining out and living inside and people are living and dying for generations to arrive to some other star system when we are leaving a perfectly good star system. So I guarantee that all of the exploration that'll be done if we don't develop a faster than light transportation system, we don't we don't trivialize spaceflight then we will be doing it all with robots. And I would be fine with that. You know, like, obviously, it would be cool to set foot on the planet Alpha Centauri and go like, wow, I'm on Alpha Centauri. But the farther the planet at Alpha Centauri looks from planet Earth, the more inhospitable it becomes like, oh, I can't breathe the atmosphere. Oh, the gravity sucks. Oh, the I don't know, the rocks are trying to eat me, um, it would not be fun. And you'd want to go back to Earth. And yet you would have spent this enormous expense took all the way to this other star system. But again, we can't underestimate what continued exponential growth looks like over vast periods of time. That if you do again, we talked about this math that you know, within 3000 years, whatever, we're going to turn the solar system into a Dyson sphere, if you just follow that growth curve, within about 700 years, a fairly medium sized project will be able to carry a significant spaceship at a high percentage of the speed of light, say 40% the speed of light, and take it to another star system that we will 
fairly easily be able to explore other star systems, even with human beings on board, although they got to be okay to live on a spaceship for say 40 years, as opposed to take a week to get there. So yeah, I think we're going to see the future in space is robots beyond Earth and its close environment. All of the universe that we're going to be exploring, we're going to be doing it with robots, with our von Neumann probes, or our berserkers. More questions in a second, but first I'd like to thank our patrons, Thomas Plum, Claire Dessel, Norval Knetton, Jonathan Keeler, Mark Siebert, and the rest of our 810 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. King's Throne, when they talk about the Big Bang and back when the universe was as small as a grapefruit, do they mean the whole universe or just the visible universe? They just mean the visible universe. So when they say the whole universe was compacted down to the size of a grapefruit, all that means is that everything that you can see today, when you look out in all directions, the very edge of the observable universe, that thing on the left, and the thing on the right were once the size of a grapefruit. But it doesn't mean what was outside of that grapefruit, it could have gone on for infinity, and would still go on for infinity today. And so that that whole idea of a singularity is sort of a misnomer, because singularity means that you have essentially compressed all of this universe into a infinitesimally small point in space. But the reality is, is that there was more space. It's just that it's the observable universe is the part that was compressed into the small man, but right outside the observable universe was more universe and then more universe beside that on for maybe ever. Just more dense in the past and less dense today. Purple. Does the expansion of the universe travel faster than the speed of light? Not exactly. Um, so, you know, when we look out to some galaxy that is, say, 10 million light years away or 50 million light years away, we can see that this galaxy is re receding away from us. And for you know, there's this thing called the Hubble constant, but for every megaparsec of space, the universe is expanding 67 ish kilometers per second. And so if you add another megaparsec, now you add those together. And so the stuff on the one side and the other are expanding away from each other at say like 135. Is that right? My math kilometers per second. And if you add a third megaparsec, now you're moving apart 190 kilometers per second, etc, to scale that up. And so eventually, if you just keep adding those megaparsecs, you can eventually cross some line where the two galaxies are expanding away from each other at faster than 300,000 kilometers per second, which is the speed of light. But they're not actually moving through space. It's just your perspective from where you are to what you see of this other galaxy. Romulus XC. Hey, Fraser, what are your thoughts about rogue black holes? Do you think there could be one in the solar system in the future? Yeah, well, so, so there was a news story that we covered on universe today just in the last week or so about a rogue black hole that was discovered. That's only 5000 light years away. And so all most all or maybe all of the black holes that have been discovered all the stellar mass black holes that have been discovered so far are in some kind of binary system that you can only detect their existence through the gravitational interactions of some other star that they're orbiting around. Maybe they're consuming material, their accretion disk is blasting off radiation. And so you can detect the existence of this black hole. You can't check the black hole directly, but you can detect it because of what it's beside. But astronomers were able to directly detect a rogue black hole through I think it was gravitational lensing. So they were able to just detect the existence of this black hole. And it's 5000 light years away. That's, that's very far as a human walks, but not very far when you think about the just the scale of the galaxy, it's in our neighborhood. Now, if that black hole was here in the solar system, it would be in charge of the solar system, it would be 10, 12 times 15 times the mass of the sun, essentially 15 times the mass of the rest of the solar system combined. So it would utterly destroy the solar system if it passed through. And so the fact that the solar system hasn't been destroyed hasn't been completely disrupted means that a rogue black hole has never come close enough to do any damage in four and a half billion years, which means that 
you can extrapolate forward and say, Oh, in another four and a half billion years, 10 billion years, the lifetime of the sun, the chances of a black hole coming that close to us are exceedingly low. So don't worry about rogue black holes. I mean, like worry about them in that they're terrifying, but don't worry because one will almost certainly not come within our star system. Although rogue black holes do go through solar systems, there's one going through, there's one destroying a solar system somewhere out there in the universe right now. But don't worry about it. Scott's astrophotos. Will we get any images of the calibration star from James Webb? I'm not sure. So so as you probably know, James Webb is now in its L2 Lagrange point. It's in the process of fine tuning the position of all of the mirrors It's trying to align them one at a time. They're doing a rough alignment, and then they're doing a more fine alignment. And there's an amazing blog post by NASA describing in excruciating detail exactly how this system works. We might be reporting it on university. I'm not sure if one of the writers decided to take a crack at it. It provides simulations of what the image will look like in the beginning and how it will improve over time as it fully aligns these mirrors. And again, it's got to get these mirrors to within just a handful of nanometers of each other in terms of alignment to create one big telescope with the specifications that are required. So it's going to take them a long time to them months and months. And they chose one star and I forget its exact number, they've picked this star, and they're going to be focusing on it and trying to align the telescope on this. And I would not be surprised if NASA starts releasing some pictures of the alignment process as they're going through it. We got an announcement like today as I'm recording this, that they have a picture of the star. So they are actually recording some pictures. And, and I haven't seen the picture. And so now it's just up to NASA on whether or not they're actually going to release these images to the public or whether they're just going to hang on to them and just keep improving them and improving them because they're going to probably be very underwhelming. It's going to be a star a bunch of blurry images of the same star, which isn't super exciting for us to see the potential of James Webb, they may just wait till the very end and then do the final observations and then first light. So I don't know the answer. Uh, we'll find out it could be by the time this show comes live, it has already happened. So so who knows. So Nancy Graziano, producer of this show asked, Did you have this view of alien civilizations prior to reading the three body problem? So let's see. So we're talking about the idea of aliens being dangerous. And, and so I think it's really important to explain that, you know, my position is that it's pointless to be worried about announcing yourself to aliens because we've already done it. Our very existence here on planet Earth has been revealed to the universe. Life, when the first oxygen creating creatures filled the atmosphere of planet Earth with oxygen, it gave off this enormous signal that 500 million years ago, life formed on planet Earth. And so any alien civilization that is concerned about there being life out there in the universe will see that know there's some kind of life on Earth and send in the berserkers and they would have done it 500 million years ago, 100 million years ago. 50,000 years ago. So the fact that we're still here means that all the aliens that are out there saw planet Earth and decided not to send in the berserker probes, which like one possibility is they are all just friendly. Their possibility is they don't exist that we're alone in the universe. The reason that we're here is because we're alone in the universe. And that's, that's my, my preferred approach. That's my preferred uh, solution. But nobody really knows the answer. So in the three body problem, there's this concept of the dark forest, and I don't want to spoil the book. But the gist of the dark forest is literally the second you realize that you live in a universe that there could be other alien civilizations out there, you keep your mouth shut, you you hide that you don't want to call any attention to your your civilization, because then someone will see you as a future potential threat and send in the berserkers and and you're done for. And the flaw with that idea as cool as that idea as cool as that science fiction idea is, the reality is that if there are any aliens out there, and they've built big telescopes, they know we're here, just as we as we build James Webb, are about to discover if they're there. James Webb is going to be the first telescope that humanity has really built that could detect the presence of life on an exoplanet. 
And just imagine like a bigger version of James Webb, maybe one that's 100 meters across. The sphere that we're going to be able to study is going to get bigger and bigger. So I don't actually have that view. I don't think that there are hostile alien civilizations out there across the Milky Way, because I don't think there are any hostile civilizations out there across the Milky Way. I think we're alone because no one's tried to wipe us out of the Milky Way yet. Matthew Armitage. There could have been many Big Bangs and many other universes too. Agree? We don't know. Um, it's possible that this is the one and only Big Bang that's ever happened in the existence of reality that some unforeseen situation happened and the universe came into existence. And then the Big Bang began the expansion of the universe. One of the implications of this idea of inflation is that there had to be many universes in this sort of bubbling, cosmic quantum fluctuation. And each of these universes is expanding on its own, and maybe they're colliding and so on. We did an episode about that. I talked to Ethan Siegel about this idea of eternal inflation. One possibility is that over time, as the universe just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and lasts longer and longer and longer, like ridiculous amounts of time, pure quantum chance will reform the universe into a new universe, a new Big Bang. So it's just inevitable. Like you get the universe, and then over some vast period of time, the universe reassembles itself into a new Big Bang, and then you get another universe, and then another Big Bang, and then another universe, etc. We don't know. We just don't know. You know, people have theories, but there is no evidence. And so until we can find any kind of evidence for one way or the other, it all has to exist in a state of pure speculation, philosophy, we just don't know the answer. And anybody who tells you that they do know the answer is wrong. They're making something up. Um, the reality is, is that we don't know. And we may never know. Jerome Goring. My daughter asked about the Oort cloud tonight, and I was wondering how you would describe it. The Oort cloud is a sphere of icy objects that surrounds the solar system. And we can't see it directly because it's all so far away. It is, if you measure the distance from the sun to the earth is like one astronomical unit. And like the distance to Pluto is like 50 times the distance of the earth to the sun. The distance to the Oort cloud could be thousands, tens of thousands of that distance away. But we know that this place exists because every now and then a comet falls down from the Oort cloud into the inner solar system, passes by the sun and flies back out into space. So you must have this vast cloud of icy material where these balls of ice are interacting with one another, or maybe a nearby planet or a nearby star system gravitationally kicks some of these objects. So they fall down into the inner solar system. And we see them as comets. So the Oort cloud is a cloud of comets that surrounds the entire solar system. Antonio Norsworthy. Why does Sirius appear to shimmer and flicker so spectacularly our atmosphere or something inherent to the star itself? In general, the stars flicker and the planets don't. And that's not completely true. I mean, the planets kind of flicker and sometimes the stars don't. And the flickering is absolutely coming from the interactions with the atmosphere. The atmosphere is this thick volume of air that is above us. And as the light makes its way through the atmosphere, it's getting refracted back and forth and diffracted by the movement of the atmosphere. And so the light takes this path. And so any time like the light may be one place, and then the atmosphere density and layers and stuff change a little bit, and then the star moves a little bit over to the side and then back over, etc. This shimmering and flickering is very pronounced with Sirius because it is the brightest star in the sky. And it's the easiest one to see. But really any star, if you look at any star, you're going to see it shimmer and flicker. And depending on the seeing that you've got that night, you know, astronomers are looking for good seeing they're looking for small amounts of water vapor in the air, they're looking for cool, dry air, where the seeing is going to be best where the flicker of the stars, the, the instability in the atmosphere is at an absolute minimum. So why do the planets appear to be very solid while the stars flicker? One of the issues is just that the planets are brighter. But also, the planets are little disks in the sky. And stars are point sources. 
And so when you sort of imagine this tiny little disk, and you can't see it with your eyes, but when you look at it through a telescope, you can absolutely see that Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, whatever is a disk. And so when you're looking with your eyes, you're seeing this little disk as it's shimmering around, but it's kind of averaging out because parts of the disk are remaining exactly the same part that they were half a second before, while with Sirius or with other stars, they could literally be jumping around in the sky. It's a point source that's jumping around. And so from our perspective, the stars shimmer while the planets don't, although they kind of do. Depends on how bad the atmosphere is. Winston Montgomery. I hear that the James Webb telescope will be able to image the first stars ever formed. How clear will those pictures be? Blurry? Actually, James Webb isn't powerful enough to image the first stars in the universe. James Webb is going to be able to image the first galaxies in the universe. And of course, when you think about the Milky Way, a galaxy that is a 120,000 light years across, it's a big place compared to one individual star and the amount of light that's being given off by one star. And in fact, as part of the decadal survey, astronomers proposed a follow on telescope, essentially the successor to James Webb called the origin space telescope. So James Webb is six and a half meters, they were hoping for a telescope that would be like James Webb, but would be more closing in say 10 meters across, but in space and infrared and cooled. And it would be so powerful that not only be able to see the first galaxies forming, but would actually be able to detect those first stars that formed. And the first stars are really important because they're made up of the primordial hydrogen and helium left over from the Big Bang. You know, after the Big Bang, say within the first few hundred thousand years, the entire universe was like the inside of the sun. And fusion was going on for the first few minutes after the Big Bang inside the entire universe, forming, you know, mashing hydrogen into helium and creating some other elements like lithium and beryllium and so on. And then the universe had expanded, it cooled down, it could no longer act like fusion, but it still was as hot as the surface of a star until finally it cooled down about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, it would cool down to the point that light could actually escape. And so you've just got these enormous clouds of just raw hydrogen and helium, they're not polluted with the heavier elements that we see in stars today. And they must have collapsed down to form the first stars. And there was an enormous amount of material to work with. The universe was more dense then than it is today. And so these first stars could have been absolutely enormous. While the limit of a star today is say 150 times the mass of the sun, these first stars could have been tens of 1000s of times the mass of the sun, or maybe the limits that stop stars from growing too big today that essentially their stellar winds get so powerful that no longer material can fall down on them. Maybe that was the same in the beginning of the universe. And so even those first stars at the beginning of the universe couldn't get any bigger than the biggest stars today. We don't know. Uh, simulations have, have shown various ideas, but we really want to be able to see those stars directly. And so you're going to need a telescope that's bigger than James Webb to see those first stars. But it's kind of inevitable. Like astronomers have said, this is what they need to finally truly get out to the very edge of the observable universe. They need something bigger than James Webb. James Webb is the introduction to the beginning of the universe. But we're gonna need a bigger telescope than James Webb. So stay tuned. That is the next mystery that comes after James Webb is what did the first stars look like in the universe? All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Super fun, uh, as always. So Again, if you've got a question about anything that we talk about in this, these episodes, or just like any question about space at all, just write them in the comments, and I'll try to gather a bunch of them up and answer them here. I do the show every Monday, 5pm Pacific time. So join us live. It's a lot of fun. All right, we'll see you all next week. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you'll want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights, and links so that you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. Did you know that all my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device? Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks, as always, to Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.